Good morning. We'll go ahead and get started with our morning service. We're very happy to have everyone here this morning, those who uh, might be worshiping with us online, all our visitors. We hope that you'll come back and worship with us. We hope that you'll fill out a yellow card that's on the back of the pew and put it in the collection plate as it comes around. A few announcements right quick before we get started. If you will, make sure your cell phones or any other devices that might go off during service is off at this time. Uh, also, if anyone has need of a nursery, you can go out in the foyer and those out there in the foyer will be able to uh, show you where to go. Uh, let's please keep Sarah Broom in our prayers as we know that she just had surgery this week. Derek said everything is going on as scheduled, but she's had a rough week. Uh, and so there's still a lot to, she has to go through to recover from this. So let's remember him and, and uh, her and the family and our prayers as they go through all this. <clears throat> also, Bobby told me that Boy Chase's test results turned out good, and he wants to thank us for the prayers on that, and we're happy to hear that. Also, it's good to see Kerry and Chris Ray back with us this week. We know that he's been dealing with some health issues. They uh, diagnosed him with epilepsy, and so that's what's been causing the seizures, and they ask for continued prayers for that. Also, let's continue to remember Teresa. She continues to get better each day. Oh, she's, yes, she's here. Glad to see you, Teresa. I'm glad you're here. <clears throat> yeah. If you will, let's go ahead and bow, and I'll do the uh, rest of the announcements uh, toward the end. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful for this day that you've given us to be able to come before you, Father. We're so thankful for all the many things that you do and give us each and every day, Father. We're so thankful for that. Chris Ray is uh, being able to be here today, Father, and that they've diagnosed the, the problem. And we pr pray that you'll continue to be with the doctors that tend to him, Father, to, to help him with, with his epilepsy, Father. We're thankful for Teresa and the well-being that she has, be able to, to come here and worship this morning with us, and we just pray that you'll continue to help her each and every day, Father. We're so thankful for Boy Chase's test results being good. We just pray for him and, and the things that he might be dealing with, Father. Father, we just pray for those who are fixing to have children, Kesslers and the Jeffords family, to be with them and be with the doctors and nurses that attend to them during, this, during that time, Father, to help them. Father, we are so thankful for this opportunity we have to be able to come and worship you, for each one of us to be able to be here today, Father, to be able to do so. We pray that all the things that we do is, is to your glory and edification of the brothers and sisters here, Father. We give you the glory and honor and praise that you deserve, Father. We thank you so much for Jesus and for the love that you all have for us and the sacrifice that he came and made for on our behalf, Father, so that we could have all the hopes of heaven and all the blessings of being a Christian and being part of your family. We're so grateful for that. Heavenly Father, we pray for the sick, all the rest of our brothers and sisters who are dealing with things and problems that they have, and that you'll be with them and help them and help those looking after them, Father, to give them the best care and the best treatment. Heavenly Father, we want to pray for those doing missionary work not only the ones we support, but the ones the other congregations support, Father, that you'll be with them and bless them with good health and help them as they reach out to, to try to bring souls to your kingdom. We pray for their safety and well-being, Father. And Father, we pray that you'll be with all of our congregation and help each and every one of us as we continue to strive and do your will and work together <clears throat> to serve you. We pray for the upcoming SALT event that we're about to have, Father, and that your glory and honor will be shown to these young people and these things that they can carry on for the rest of their life to help them to be who you'd have them to be, Father. And Father, we, we do pray for our visitors, and we thank you for them being able to come out and worship with us today, and we pray for their safe travel as they go back home. Forgive us of the things that we do wrong, Father, and help us to always 
live and serve you as we should. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
I saw him before our scripture reading and prayer would be him number 210. Second Corinthians 4, verses 1 through 6. Second Corinthians 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, 
but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our dear God, as we humbly come before you now, we come to worship you in spirit and truth. That we base everything we learn today upon thy word and scriptures, that we can take it to heart, be able to apply it to our lives, and be able to live it in our lives to show you to all of those around us, that some way we may be able to influence them. We know, dear God, without you we are nothing, for you gave us all, and especially the greatest blessing of thy Son dying for our sins on the cross. Be with us now as we further worship thee. May it be in spirit and truth. In Christ's name, amen. Our invitational song after the lesson will be in our folders, B83. B83. Once you get that marked, uh, our final selection will be hymn number 394. 394. Sing all three verses. Willing, able, please stand. <coughs> to be here with all of you today. We are thankful for everybody that's present, including some who are visiting with us today. We want you to know that you're our honored guest, and we're going to try to make you feel that way. If you'll give us an opportunity, just stay a few moments following the dismissal prayer, and we'll 
try to shake your hand and, and uh, get to know you. Or if you don't shake hands, we'll, we'll wave at you and uh, let you know that we appreciate you. We're glad that you're here. The Apostle Paul is a fascinating character. I think most of the time when we think about him, we think about the Apostle Paul. And as we do that, we may forget where he came from, what his life was like before. The Corinthian Christians, because of what was going on in Corinth, because of false teachers had come in there, and those false teachers were making statements about Paul and as well as Jesus Christ that were not accurate. Because of that, uh, they somewhat elicit some things from Paul that, that remind us about his background and bring us into his present in a more powerful way. That's the case with the passage that you heard read just a few moments ago from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. It starts off, as we're going to observe this morning, with Paul's service. And in particular, we're talking about him serving God instead of the devil. Listen to him in verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Receive mercy? First of all, notice that the idea there, the word received, is passive. Paul did not do anything for God to extend his mercy to him. And might I add to that, neither do I, neither do you, do anything that causes God to extend his mercy. We just sang about it, about Jesus dying on the cross. Did you or I do anything that merited that death on the cross? The obvious answer is no. That mercy was extended by God when man was struggling with sin. So Paul highlights that. He's a servant of God, and he's a servant of God by his mercy because he extended that grace and that mercy to him. Look at the book of 1 Timothy, if you would. The uh, the young man Timothy is under training, as it were, with the Apostle Paul. And Paul points out to him what his life was like previously. And then, of course, what it's like as he writes this letter. Listen to him, 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now previously, remember, we saw the word received is passive. Here we find the word enabled, and that means he empowered me. He gave me the power to do this, to serve in this ministry. And boy, when you look at the next verse, you got to go, wow. He did it despite that. Listen to him. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Christ Jesus might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Paul has a ministry. And that ministry involves a couple of things that he pointed out in those last two verses that we read. Number one, Jesus came to save sinners and I am number one. <laughs> what an odd thing to hold up your foam finger to. I'm the number one sinner, but that's exactly what he says. God showed him mercy. That's, that's what comes next in verse 16. For what purpose? That in me first, and there he goes again, the same word, 
that I can be the number one example of what mercy will do for you, of the power that it can have in your life. And the beauty of that is, as he sets that forth among other people, they can see the way to heaven. Why? Because Paul serves God. That's why. He does not serve the devil. Now you might say, why say not the devil? Well, read on, if you will, of realizing, first of all, before we get to that, that Paul said he was what about that? How did he put that? We do not lose heart. Jesus said, don't lose heart. Isn't that, isn't that what Luke indicated that that parable was all about? Luke chapter 18, verse 1, he spoke this parable for what? In, that men should always pray and not lose heart. Well, Paul didn't lose heart. But around him were those who not only had lost heart, they had devoted themselves to the service of Satan. So listen to him in verse 2 at the beginning. But we've renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully. What did other people do? Other people took the Word of God and they used it craftily. The word they're used, craftily, means they're willing to do anything. To trick people into obeying and believing what's wrong, what's in error. Paul said, I don't do that. That's the devil's people that do that. He goes ahead and he uses the word deceitfully. And the word deceitfully there literally is a word that means to ensnare or entrap by bait. So you think about the fellow that's out there uh, that's fishing. What are you using for bait today? I see you're catching a lot of fish. By the way, good fishermen won't tell you. <laughs> I found that out a long time ago. As good as, uh, as uh, Elliot is at fishing, he's not going to tell me what... Well, he might tell me because I'm a friend, but he's not going to tell most people. What are they biting on? Oh, you know, they're just biting today. They're just biting. <laughs> no, in, no information about what they're using for bait. Well, these fellas, these fellas are using deceitful practices to capture people, to ensnare them with the bait that they are using. Paul said, I don't do that. But now watch, because he goes on down verses 3 and 4, and he tells what happens when some people do do this. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. What's the goal of the devil and his teachers? Keep people from seeing the truth. Keep people from seeing the light. Keep people from going to heaven. Paul said, I serve God, not the devil. And that's very, very powerful, isn't it? When you think about it. And then, at the end of verse 2, he explained how he did that. When he goes on to say, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. What, Paul, what are you doing in everything Paul did, he said, I'm trying to manifest, to display, to show to everybody that hears me the truth. Why truth? Because Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 32 says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's why Paul, as a servant of God, was constantly setting forth truth. Listen to him earlier in this same epistle, chapter 2, verse 17, when he says, For we are not, as so many, peddling the Word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. <clears throat> the word peddling is an interesting word. <clears throat> it describes watering something down. Okay? Now, those that know me really well know that, that I have one particular weakness. My, don't tell my dentist, but my weakness is Dr. Pepper. Okay? 
Every now and then I walk into a, a, a travel center somewhere and I'm looking for a Dr. Pepper. But I have learned to be careful because those machines don't always have the right mixture. I do not want pure syrup, but I'll tell you what I want even less. Mostly water. Watered down Dr. Pepper does not taste good. I don't think many things do, to be honest about it. Paul said, I'm not delivering a watered down gospel like some people do. Why did they water it down? We've already seen it. They watered it down so that, so that those people would not end up on God's side. They would not be what they ought to be. Go on again in chapter 3, verse 12, where he says, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. What do you do, Paul? I don't, I don't water down the Word of God. I deliver it. I deliver it with boldness. The idea behind boldness most often in the New Testament is the idea of saying whatever it is you want or need to say. And doesn't that describe Paul to a T? In the book of Acts chapter 20 and verse 20, he's called for those elders to come from Ephesus to Miletus. He's talking with them one last time face to face. And as he talks to them, among other things, he says this, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. Paul was a servant of God. And as a servant of God, he boldly delivered the truth because only the truth would make people free. But then also observe that Paul said he was preaching Christ not himself. Listen to him now at the beginning of verse 5 of this chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. I, I kept telling myself the whole time I stayed for this lesson, I'm going to look up if there's another case where Paul put it in that order. Usually he says the Lord Jesus Christ. But here he says Christ Jesus the Lord. <clears throat> and I don't know the entire reason that he may have done that. But let me, let me talk about, let's talk about what does that mean? What's he going into here? Well, let's start with the word Christ because that's the word he started with. The word Christ means anointed. In the Old Testament, it would be the same word that's translated Messiah. And the Jews were looking for the Messiah. Paul, growing up as a Jew at the feet of Gamaliel, would certainly have been looking for the Messiah. Well, what is he doing here? He's starting out number one. This is the Messiah. This is the one. We've been looking for him. He at last has arrived. Go back now, if you will, to chapter 2, verse 14 where he had already said, Now thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, through us and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. You've got to know a little bit about uh, Roman history to understand what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. When the Romans won a great victory, they would have a parade they would enter into the city of Rome. They'd go through what the Arc de Triomphe when it eventually was built. They'd go through that, for example. And as they marched through, you'd have the, the general or the king, depends on who led them in the battle. He would be at the forefront. And then behind him, of course, was his army. And walking beside them were priests. Now, these, of course, were priests of false gods. I understand that. But they were carrying censers, and they had incense in, the, in those censers, and they had lit it so that it was, it was smoldering, it was putting out smoke with a smell all over the place. So as the soldiers marked in, marched in, that smell to them was the smell of victory. What was it to the prisoners that were walking at the end of the line? 
in chains, maybe devoid of any clothing, or certainly having very uh, tattered and torn clothing. They'd lost the battle. What was it to them? Well, listen to Paul, because he's not through yet. As he goes on to say in verse 15, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among whom you, who, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Now notice that. We Christians, we are the aroma of Christ. We're the smell of Christ's victory. When you come here as a child of God, wherever you go as a child of God, you've got to recognize something. You represent victory in Jesus. You're the smell of victory. And folks ought to see that. And because of it, they ought to be drawn to the truth. But those who refuse to see it, those who will not yield in that case, to them, the smell of victory in you is the smell of death in them. Death in eternity because they don't obey the gospel. So Paul starts out with the victorious anointed Jesus, the Christ. And then he says, Jesus. Jesus, literally translated, would be God is salvation. Go with me, if you will, to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1. And you may remember what's going on here. Mary is with child. She is betrothed to Joseph. Now, betrothal, we don't even have an equivalent to betrothal. <clears throat> uh, the closest thing we have to it is an engagement. But I have known young ladies who had engagement rings from multiple guys. <laughs> they got engaged and they broke it off and they got engaged and broke it off and on it went. Engagement is taken sometimes uh, lightly in our society. Not so back then. Back then, a betrothal might literally have taken place when the two were children. When they were so young, they, they didn't make a commitment. Who made the commitment? Mom and dad. Mom and dad committed them to marriage. And they were considered, even as a small child, she was considered to be his wife. He was considered to be her husband. Now, don't get me wrong. They've not consummated the marriage. Don't go there. They didn't do that, not until the time when there was a marriage feast. And, and finally, that marriage was brought to fruition at that point. Well, obviously, Joseph and Mary are not there yet. They've still got to go to the marriage feast. They've still got to culminate uh, this great uh, union that has been, uh, has been committed to years and years ago. Well, marriage with child, what does that mean? She'd been unfaithful to him. She's had relations with another man. At least that's all Joseph could think of. But an angel comes to Joseph and begins to explain, no, 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 this child is from God. The Holy Spirit caused her to have this child in her. She has not been unfaithful to you. And as he talks about that in verse 21 of Matthew 1, he says, and she will bring forth a son... And you should call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Is he the anointed of God? No doubt about it. Is he also the savior of his people? No doubt about that either. And Paul makes that very, very clear as he writes to these brethren at Corinth. How important is that role of salvation? Well, Young people and moms and dads, you're supposed to be studying the book of Romans. Romans chapter 7, to me, is one, one of the most challenging chapters in that book. I didn't say it was the only one. I said it's one of. <laughs> but when you get into there, Paul goes into this great discussion. 
And he says, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I do do. And he goes through that to the point I get confused, you know, to be honest about it. He's so back and forth with, with this is what I would like to do in my mind, but with my body, I'm doing something else. And finally, he gets to verse 24 of Romans chapter 7. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. How important is Jesus? To every person who has ever struggled with sin, could I just make a side note for all of us? We've all struggled with sin. Sin is the common lot of mankind. When we reach an age where we know the difference between right and wrong, we all sin. Isn't that what Paul also said? Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23. You know, you might say, well, everybody's doing it, so what difference does it make? Well, Paul tells us that too, doesn't he? Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that death he's talking about there is contrasted with eternal life. He's talking about eternal death. He's talking about the death that John hears about in Revelation chapter 20 in the closing verses. He's talking about being cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. It's not really currently in our society popular to say it, but he's saying sin earns you a special spot in hell. That's what he's saying. Well, then all of a sudden, this idea of Jesus becomes vitally important, doesn't it? I need him because he's the only way that I will be saved. So he begins with the anointed. He talks about the Savior. And then he says, Lord. The Lord. And the word here describes a divine, absolute master. Maybe I need to slow down and think about that myself. Divine, and He's God. Absolute, nobody's above Him. Nobody deserves my loyalty ahead of Him. And finally, just in case we missed it, Master. He's in control. Now brethren, don't we all need... I, look, I'm not saying we all just, just to be, you know... Uh, editorializing or something like that and pointing fingers at you. We all, me included, we all, what? We all need to ask ourselves the question, who rules my life? Who is the master of my life? Paul said it was the anointed Savior who was the master of his life and there's good reason that it ought to be that way. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Paul has just talked about in Philippians chapter 2 how that Jesus uh, came to this earth having given up all the glory of heaven. He walked as a man for what purpose? So that he could die. He could die in accord with the Lord's will. And having said that, then he goes on in verse 9. He says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and of those on the earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Here's something that I think we all need to think about. And that is... I am going to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. You are going to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. There, there's no question about that. The question then becomes this. When are you going to acknowledge Him as Lord? If you acknowledge Him as Lord now, if you submit to Him as the Master and do what He said, Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, he that believeth in his baptized shall be saved. If you submit now, you'll be part of the saved. 
You'll be part of his body, the church. You will be heaven bound. But if you choose not to submit to him now, there's going to come a day when you will stand before the throne of God Almighty and you will confess Jesus as Lord right before you're cast into hell. That's not a very pretty picture to me. It's not the picture I want for my own life. Could I say this? It's not the picture I want for your life either. All of us need to recognize His Lordship now. Submit to Him today. The Apostle Paul talks about it in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Here's the way he says it there. That you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until the Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which He will manifest in His own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, wait a minute. Is Timothy an unbeliever when this letter is written to him? No, he's a Christian. He's actually a preacher out delivering the Word of God, carrying the message of God, because as Paul directs him to go here and there and do, do the, the bidding of God that is brought forth through this, uh, this apostle. So do you notice something about that quote? That quote says to Timothy, a Christian, you be sure to keep yourself without spot. You be sure to keep yourself blameless. I, I thought a Christian couldn't fall from grace. Well, that's what the world will tell you. But what does Paul say? He says, Timothy, you better make sure you stay where you're supposed to be because you don't want to lose what you have. Recognize Jesus as the potentate. That's a tough word. We don't use, if we use that, you use that word, please come see me after this lesson. I never, never use that except when I'm reading Timothy. It just means a superior ruler, the great ruler, you know, something along that order. King of kings, Lord of lords. There's no other master greater than Jesus. In the book of Revelation, you find the, a brief description of the battle that everybody seems to want to talk about. But I want to listen to one verse in reference to that. It's verse 14 at the beginning of Revelation 17. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. That's the whole battle, by the way, right there. In those few words. For He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. Paul rendered service. In his service, he made sure that he served God, not the devil. In his service, he preached Christ and not himself. Why? Because Jesus is God's anointed. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus should be the Master. And one day, He will be. Our plea is simple. Don't wait till one day. Don't wait till the judgment day. Instead, acknowledge Him as Lord today. Come while we sing.
Savior. As we prepare our hearts and minds for protecting the Lord's Supper, we still in our fault will be B79. B79. <coughs> We gather here chapter 5 starting in verse 6 he says for while we were still helpless at the right time Christ died for the ungodly for one will hardly die for a righteous man though perhaps for a good man someone would uh, dare even to die but God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us that shows us that we are really because we are sinners we can never be worthy of the sacrifice that God has made. Then in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, For I received this from the Lord, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which you betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cups after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until it comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of Christ. But let a man examine himself and eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We are unworthy of the sacrifice. But we can partake in a worthy manner. 
So we are here today to have our minds focused on the death of Christ. So let's all do that and partake of this, this memorial feast in a worthy manner. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we are so grateful for this time. Father, we're always grateful for remembering your son's death and the time that we can do that. And Father, as we partake of this bread, help us have our minds focused now on the cross and his sacrifice that saves us from our sins. Help us partake of this bread in a worthy manner. In Jesus' name, amen. Bow with me again, please. Father, we recognize we are unworthy servants of yours, Father, but we are so thankful for your grace and mercy and the shedding of your son's blood that saves us from our sins. So, Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine that represents that blood that was shed, help us remove everything from our minds except for that great sacrifice that was made for us. Help us partake of it in a manner pleasing to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Close the Lord's Supper as these men are up here. We'll go ahead and give back to the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul tells us through the Holy Spirit that we're to give as we've purposed in our heart and to give and be cheerful givers. And then in verse 8, he says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. If we're good givers, God will bless us to give. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for the bounty that you give us every day. Father, we're beyond blessed in material blessings, Father. So, Father, we do ask that we would, as we've purposed in our heart, be cheerful givers this morning and give back as you so blessed us. We love you and thank you so much for your son and particularly the blessings of salvation. Forgive us for our sins in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we're so thankful for everyone for being here today, visitors. We hope that you will come back and worship with us. We hope that each one of you can come back this evening at 5.30 for our evening service. A few reminders right quick. Um, we're collecting school supplies for the Berean Children's Home. Please check the bulletin board for details. Also, this coming Friday through Sunday, starting <clears throat> Friday evening, will be salt. Uh, we're in need of canned drinks, Coke, Diet Coke, Mountain Dew, and Dr. Pepper. If you will, you can, you can bring them and leave them on one of the tables in the foyer. Also, there's two tables out there in the foyer, one on the north end and one on the south end out in the foyer for the Kessler and the Jeffers family and the upcoming children that's uh, fixing to have. Uh, also, please check your bulletins this week for the SALT schedule. I know on your bulletin here that there's a layout of everything and what time it will be. Also, let's continue to remember all our brothers and sisters that are in the bulletin that are sick and, and having different problems and needs. August the 5th, there will be the anniversary party honoring Gary and Teresa Hampton in the downstairs fellowship hall uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. It's August the 5th on Saturday. Car care group number four will meet following evening service. And also we have an elders and deacons meeting this afternoon at 415. And we, we really need all the deacons to be there. Following service this morning, if you will, meet down front here for those who have signed up to help for SALT. Uh, those are who might not have helped. Uh, have signed up but still want to help, uh, they're going to have a meeting down front here following morning service, if you will. Please be down here for that. Also, if you will, stand and we'll have our closing song and closing prayer. Thank you. Our final selection will be in our folders. It'll be B38. B38. We start with Sopranos. I'll have to be the Lord be there for me.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this first day of the week that we could come together and worship you and, and hear, hear lessons about your word that we can take into our lives each day. Lord, I pray that you'll be with those that uh, are sick and healing and, and comfort them and, and be with them and help them to be able to come back and, and be able to worship in person with us. Lord, I pray that you'll help keep us all safe um, this afternoon and, and this week. And Lord, help us all to have the heart and the mindset to, to be back this evening to worship you again uh, with our fellow brothers and sisters. Uh, in Christ's name we pray. Amen.